Hello everybody, this is Havoc with what I would consider one of the more important tutorials in this entire series, and that's going over the user interface of Crusader Kings 3. There is a ton of things going on at any one time, which can be very overwhelming, especially for new players. This video will go over the main aspects of the UI design, pretty much limited to what your main screen icons do and how you can interact with them. We won't be able to go over every single menu and sub-menu since there is just too many to cover. This would be an hours long video, and this video is already going to be quite the hefty one. But again, if you watch any of the videos in this series, I recommend this one probably above all of them. Let's dive in. Toggling Tooltips Before we get into the depths of the user interface, I wanted to quickly go over the tooltips as you'll be using these extensively at all levels of Crusader Kings experience. About any time you hover over anything in Crusader Kings 3, a tooltip will pop up, giving you a brief definition of that item. Inside that tooltip are words highlighted in a light blue, signifying that those words have tooltip definitions themselves. The system can lead to some serious rabbit holes for those that actually really want to dig but generally it can help you understand the multiple levels of information that are present throughout the game. It is very much worth doing some digging while playing, especially as a new player to the game. Some concepts just aren't obvious or well explained, and the tooltips will at least give you some idea on what you are hopefully looking for. Now by default, in order to lock a tooltip and access another in the same box, you have to keep your mouse still for a set amount of time before a transparent screen locks it. To me, that's a pain, and there is a much quicker solution. Go to Settings, then Game. Under Tooltip Modes, select Action Lock. This will let you lock a tooltip by clicking the middle mouse button, letting you have a bit more movement and instantly locking the tooltip instead of having to wait. For me, this sped up the tooltip searching abilities and, at least for me, relieved the frustration of the default hover mode. Top bar UI. It's hard to know where to begin with the UI since there is just so much, so we will simply start at the top and work our way around clockwise. The top bar UI contains two very helpful parts of Empire Management, your issues and resources. The issues are represented by your diamond icons and the funky little flower looking icon with the numbers inside of it. The diamond issue icons are issues that need your immediate attention. When starting a campaign or having a new ruler, the lifestyle choice issue will always pop up. Your lifestyle choice will heavily influence your leader's traits and ability to rule, so lifestyle choices are very important to get figured out. The next typical icon issue occurs if you or your heir are unmarried. Considering that the continuation of your dynasty through the ages is the goal of the game, being married and having them babies is a bit important, at least if you're a Christian ruler. Clicking on the icon brings up the Arrange Marriage Simulator, where you can pick any available character to marry, assuming their ruler approves of said marriage. The last couple of main issue icons I've noticed revolve around having too many holdings, duchies, or vassals. Having more than your limit in any of these areas will cause your vassals to lose their opinion of you over time, or reduce the income and troops vassals will contribute so it's pretty important to make sure you resolve these issues as quickly as possible. In regards to these specifically, I recommend watching my vassals tutorial for a way to resolve having an overabundance of lands or direct vassals. The last of the issues icons gives you a nice breakdown list of anything that generally needs attention to or just a tab of things you can do in terms of characters or your empire. It's important to keep an eye on this tab and reference it often as you'll find a lot of helpful clues to make things run more efficiently from titles that can be created, wars you can start, down to unmarried children or people you can imprison. If you ever find yourself at a slow point during your campaign, this list is definitely something that can help give you ideas on what to do. The bar next to your issue icons holds your resources that are usable during your campaign and your domain limit. Gold is primarily earned from your own lands, your domain, and the lands that your vassals hold. It can be used to create titles, fabricate claims, bribe other characters, and develop buildings in your empire. Prestige represents a character's level of fame or social standing. You gain prestige through owning lands and titles, your foreign affairs levels, and modified through certain traits. Use prestige to start a war or call on allies to join one, 
or even level up your crown authority. Piety is the level of religious devotion and virtue your character has. Acting piously and going with the tenets of your faith will gain you piety. Piety is required to declare holy wars against other religions, can allow you to request money from your bishop as well as other governmental ordinances or doctrines. If prestige is a character's level of fame, renown is the dynastic version of that. Renown is the level of splendor shared by your entire dynasty. It is gained by the number of family members alive, the number of characters in your family that are rulers, and the number of spouses that are married to other rulers. It is wise, therefore, to marry your children, siblings, and other dynastic characters into other empires. Renown can be spent primarily on dynastic legacies to enhance all family members of the dynasty in various ways. The last resource, per se, is your soldiers. The number at the corner is the total number of soldiers you can use immediately, including your knights. The diamond formation at the right of the number is the quality of the men on raising them, ranging from low to superior quality. There are several ways to increase your soldiers' counts, from acquiring more vassals to building military buildings, even hiring professional soldiers. Soldiers are expensive though, so be mindful of their cost before going to war. Your domain limit is the limit of how much land you can personally own. Having over that limit will cause you to lose money and your vassal's opinion of you, as I've already discussed. Hovering over any of these resources will give you a breakdown of how that number is achieved. Hovering over each number contributing to the overall number will further break down factors, mainly in terms of individual contribution and things modifying it. Empire Management Bar as we move to the right side of the screen, there are seven colored buttons. These are what I call empire management buttons, as they tend to relate more towards an entire empire-wide events and actions rather than your own character. The realm tab focuses on your own lands within your empire, your authority over them, and succession. Crown authority is the level of control over your vassals. Each level increases that control, much to the displeasure of your vassals. Leveling up your crown authority will be essential with higher levels of role, so keep this in mind. Your domain, as mentioned, are lands that you personally own. In this tab, you can see your various lands, how much money and levies they give you, and the current level of development and control. This is a quick way to see all of your lands and which are being productive or not. These lands are also labeled on the campaign map by a blue flag behind the name, and on clicking that flag, you will have the same information brought up. This is an easy solution to finding your lands on the campaign map. The next tab are your vassals, showing their opinion of you, their contracts, if they can be modified, and their own contributions to you via gold and levies. Keep an eye on your vassals using this screen throughout your campaign so that you aren't caught off guard if one of your own vassals trends towards hating you or is trying to do something outside of your approval. And lastly, succession. Succession is obviously what happens to your empire when you die. You can change succession laws if you meet the requirements, which always entails certain technologies be researched and a high level of crown authority. Laws include what lands your heir will inherit versus the rest of your children, and who amongst your children can even inherit lands. Next up is your military tab. This section holds information on various aspects of your military, starting with the ability to raise your armies and disband them. When starting a war, a Raise All Armies button will appear on the bottom right of your screen, but especially in the case of a raiding culture, you can do it from here. Also note that you cannot raise your armies preemptively before declaring war, only after. Your military is broken up into three sections as well. Your armies is the default opener and it holds your total number of troops at the top your levies, which will show their current and maximum numbers when below said maximum, your current and total number of knights, which always shows both numbers, so you know if you have your maximum, and your men-at-arms regiments, the more professional soldiers. These have to be recruited manually by the player, and clicking on either the levies or any of the men-at-arms units will give you a breakdown of their size, their combat stats, their unit type, counters, and terrain effects. For maximum usage, it is recommended to read through all units so you know what terrain and armies to fight on. The Knights tab brings up the list of your current Knights and their prowess or their ability to fight in battle. You can choose which Knights you want to have fight or not, and as a tip here, your Marshal, assuming he is a Knight, should be switched to Forbid. 
A good marshal usually has a high marshal skill, different word there, and you don't want him dying on the battlefield, it's not a good way to rule your empire. If you are low on knights, you can, once in a decade, invite knights to your court where you can hire them if they fit your bill. It's a very handy tool to have. Moving on to the mercenaries tab. Mercenaries are a group of men who have no allegiances to any factions, are composed of various types of men-at-arms soldiers, and have various degrees of quality. They only require an upfront charge to fight for you, which is pretty handy. The further down you go on the tab, the more types and quantities of troops are available at a higher cost, of course. The last tab is Holy Orders, which require a decently hefty amount of gold and piety to even create. These Holy Orders are independent military organizations that work to defend and expand their respective faiths. Next on the right tab is your council. Your council assists your ruler in running the admin side of your realm. They each have their own respective tasks that tie into the five main skills presented in the game. Check out what each task does by hovering over the button to get a tooltip pop-up. Ideally, if you have powerful vassals, you will want to put them in those council positions. Your court consists of characters that do not yet own land, which includes any family or potentially powerful nobles and commoners. Your court consists of two groups of characters, guests and courtiers. Guests are various characters that are traveling through. They will not stay forever and can only be used if you hire them. Next are your courtiers. These are the aforementioned family members, nobles and commoners that do not own land, although they can serve in many areas of your realm, such as counselor members, court physicians, or in the army as knights or commanders. One interesting strategy is inviting claimants. This extends an invite to characters that have valid claims on territory in the campaign map. Recruiting these characters will allow you, as their liege, to press that claim, giving you a reason to go to war with another faction on your court character's behalf, of course. Your court main tab is where you'll also find your prisoners. You can imprison various court characters for a lot of reasons, some valid, some not. Note that the likelihood of them going willingly depends on several factors as well. There is always a risk of causing rebellion if the person you are arresting is too popular amongst the court. The Intrigue tab is where you will keep track of schemes, hooks, and secrets. The Schemes tab will show you what you are engaging in and their progress, as well as who you can invite to advance the success of the scheme. You can also see any personal schemes to woo another character into liking you, and any schemes you or your court discover about yourself will be displayed at the bottom. Hooks and secrets are essentially blackmail items you discover about other characters. You can use these at specific times to force a faction to do something they normally wouldn't. Note here that other characters can do the same to you in order to get you, their liege, to help them out with something you normally wouldn't. Factions are a group of vassals that seek to push a certain agenda against you, be it installing a new leader or declaring independence. Once a faction reaches its threshold, they can, give you an, they can give you an ultimatum, a peaceful option out to comply or they rebel. Your last tab on the right is your decisions. This is a group of major and minor decisions that can affect the path your campaign goes down. Each character has its own set of major decisions, while all will share the minor ones. Major decisions all have decently high requirement costs, from land owned to certain technologies, even multiple high amounts of resources to an act. These are not required to do at all, they are merely there for achievement hunting or if you want to pursue a certain campaign path. Maps, time, and in-game researching. The bottom right UI is a heck of a lot more condensed than your empire management bar. First up are your various map modes. These map modes allow you to see the map broken up into various filters, from realms to empire, religious, cultural, government type, terrain, and more. These will be helpful to plan future expansions or see why a certain area is the way that it is. And don't forget to click on the plus sign to access those extra modes, not on the main icons. Your time bar is pretty straightforward. The space bar on your keyboard will pause and unpause the game. The top numbers 1 through 5 on the keyboard will adjust the speed accordingly, although you can also use the plus or minus on your number pad have one. To the left of that is the current date which will advance faster or slower depending on your game speed. Last for this section of the UI is what I'm calling your in-game research. The spyglass will allow you to search for any character, title, settlement name, etc. from within the game. 
letting you see where that object is that you are wanting to find. The book contains your encyclopedia, and it has every single word that you can find within a tooltip. Use this encyclopedia to find certain game concepts, mechanics, or just things that you do not understand. I use it pretty consistently myself, and it's a very solid tool to have. Dynasty and Character Management This last UI area goes over your own personal character and their interactions with their dynasty and other characters. Clicking on your coat of arms brings up your highest title that you own on the campaign map, including any other titles that you hold within that highest title and what you have yet to create within it. Confused yet? While in this title section, you can see what, if any, vassals that have their allegiance to the title and not you personally. Clicking on your portrait brings up your character panel and it is by far the most information on a single tab in the entire game. Also note that this character panel will look the same for all characters, meaning you can quickly check out a character and their stats to see how you want to interact with them. With so much to cover, I will give some basics. Any traits that you have will be displayed right under your character, with your skills underneath that. Both heavily influence your character and the vassal's opinion of you. Next to your skills are your current religion and culture within the current house you are associated with. The large section in the middle contains the character's empire stats, from titles, claims, and holdings, to diplomacy with other factions, and the dread, gold, prestige, piety, and levy numbers. And lastly, at the bottom of the character panel is relevant relations with other characters within their realm. Family members, court members, unique relationships, and vassals. You can use this panel to quickly interact with the people of your court without having to go through other panels to access them. We're almost done, and with three more tabs to address to the right of your character portrait. The first is your Dynasty tab, where you can see all members of your dynasty and your own personal house. These are also where you can open and enact legacies, although you have to be the dynasty head in order to enact dynasty legacies. Next is your religions tab, giving you information related to the beliefs of the religion and faith that you follow. This will help you understand what is allowed and what's not, as well as why certain mechanics function the way they do. Not to mention, of course, your faction head. You can create your own religion, but that requires a pretty massive amount of piety. The very last thing we will look at is your Innovations tab. Innovations replace tech in CK3, and it's driven by your faction's culture. Only as the cultural head can you choose and influence the innovations that are researched, and a certain amount of innovations are required to advance to the next age. But wait, I forgot something, had to add it in, and it's pretty critical. Stress. Stress occurs when certain situations happen that either go against your character's traits or when something personally tragic happens, like the loss of a close family member. With three levels of stress, each time you break through to the next level, you run the risk of having a complete meltdown. And believe me, that's not something you want to go through. Ladies and gentlemen, that will finally be all for the main UI breakdown in Crusader Kings 3. That was a lot to go over, and while most of this is pretty simple to understand and laid out very well, I found it helpful for even myself to spend some time on each aspect of the user interface to really grasp what it does. I do hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions at all regarding the UI, do not hesitate to drop a comment down below. If you haven't bought the game yet or are looking for ways to support the channel, give my custom game store a look-see at nexus.gg forward slash h for havoc. It is customized to my own standards with games I've chosen to showcase purposefully and when you buy it, you can see exactly how much you're supporting my channel. It's always appreciated, but as always, never ever mandatory. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with future tutorials. This is Havoc, and I will see you in the next video.